Okay, you're on. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Back to Balticon 55, if you're just joining us. And this is the panel Alien Life in Science Fiction and Astrobiology. I'm your moderator today. I'm Jeannie Adams. And I'm going to have our wonderful panel introduce themselves because we have a cast of luminaries. CJ, let's start with you. Uh, yes, hello. <laughs> You need Would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, well, that's me, C.J. Cherry. I, I write um, science fiction and fantasy. I've written a few aliens. A few. <laughs> Caitlin? Hi, I'm Dr. Caitlin Ahrens. I'm a researcher at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center here in Greenbelt, Maryland. Most excellent. Tom? Hi, I'm Dr. Tom Holtz. I'm a a vertebrate paleontologist with the Department of Geology at the University of Maryland, and I have a research associate position with the Department of Paleobiology at the Smithsonian. Very cool. Jim? My, my name is Jim Bell. I'm a nuclear engineer, and I have studied a lot about the effects of energy in the environment, and some of those environmental effects can, can be involved in alien species and how they might develop. Very cool. So, you know, the, the, um, Description for this panel is, you know, science fiction and fantasy writers like CJ, like many of us, have postulated the viability of alien species across the galaxy from, uh, you know, the predator uh, to the aliens in Independence Day to the ones in the quiet place. And what are some of the realistic, most realistic portrayals you have seen? of aliens and now obviously this is all still speculative because we haven't met them yet, but what are some of the most realistic uh, portrayals you've seen? Obviously some in CJ's book, books, but CJ, what are, do you think other than your own books, some of the most realistic portrayals or thought, thought through portrayals of aliens in science fiction? Um, I think most of them I met in my biology book, but um, uh, it's 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 hard for me to to separate them out because I I enjoy the stories and right. any alien that generates a good story is um, obviously on my preferred list. Yeah, um, it's a little difficult to write about paramecium. True, true. Jim, what about you? What do you think are some that have been done well and plausible? Well, plausibly. the ones. The ones that I would consider plausible are the ones that have a reason for doing what they're doing. Even if we, the reader, don't know what they're, why they're doing it, there has to be a reason. It has to make sense to them. Also, if they come to us, they probably have better technology than us, at least in some areas involving travel. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. We'd be there. Right. So the, the one, that, one of the ones that fits that criteria the most for me is the one called Footfall by Niven and Pornell. That's one of the ones where the aliens come to us, they have a reason for what they do, even if it doesn't appear to make a lot of sense to us. It does in the story and the readers eventually figure it out. What type of xenotype are the aliens in that one? I, I've read it, but I don't remember. Well, the easiest way to describe them is they look like baby elephants with forked trunks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe I haven't read that one because I think I would remember that. <laughs> Was the biology presented in such a way mm. that it, it seemed logical? Yes, I, it did. And to go further, I'd have to tell the book. Uh, <laughs> and and it, I, I, don't need to, I don't think I need to do that. Okay. <laughs> Tom, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I'm going to throw out uh, a, a really weird one. Um, and that's The War with the Couture, uh, David Gerald's ongoing series, although it's been on hiatus since 93. Um, and the aspect there is that it's an invading ecosystem, only there are lots of hints so far that it isn't an ecosystem any more than an individual multicellular animal is a colony of single cells. It looks like it is a form of biology that looks from our point of view like an ecosystem, but is so extremely highly integrated. It's it looks like the bodies of different types of animals, but it's one thing. Um, uh -huh. And the method of its delivery 
onto Earth, which is eventually explained, is, is pretty interesting. Um, the way that it assimilates uh, creatures on Earth is pretty interesting. And it looks pretty bleak for humanity and for the terrestrial ecosystem as it is currently in the novel, in the novel so far. So we will see if uh, humans survive. <laughs> Absolutely. Caitlin, what are your thoughts? I, I, I actually agree with what Jim said earlier, though, is that if they were to be here, they are essentially scientists. And that's something that we could either have fun with in, in literature and certainly in cinema as well, where if you have an alien species, they're not immediately going, oh, we're going to conquer everything. Uh, but rather, they should be a, scientific about it. They should be curious about the planet. Why did they even come here? Uh, you know, what kind of instruments that they would have? What kind of experiments would they would they really go into? I I, I personally like Asimov's uh, works. Um, Nemesis comes to mind of just like, oh, yeah, somebody put that in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I already had that in mind. So thank you, whoever put that in chat. Uh, but I, but it's something that I think needs to be explored a little bit more, uh, in my opinion, though. But certainly, whether, uh, as you mean, in terms of whether the first contact would be with scientists or whether they would be colonizers scientific exploration yeah. so you'd yeah. rather see that yeah 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 it's uh it's interesting to me that so far we have have followed our own practice in uh behavior and in fiction that we have presented anyone coming here as uh colonizers rather than scientists that's always such an interesting uh perspective in, in my own work um there's develops after the situation on Gehenna, what's called the Gehenna Doctrine, which means that you may not contact another species except in space. So on, only in space and not on their planet. Yes. Lest there be poisoning. Lest um, there be um, a contamination of, of a life form and interactions you didn't plan. Right. Right, because there's always that unplanned thing, because as Jeff Goldblum likes to say, life will find a way. Um, so one of the things that several movies and books have, have postulated is that um, the reptiles will be much more likely to be a, an advanced sentient species on other planets. Uh, Tom, what's your thought on that? Well, um... Reptiles have done a lot. Uh, keep in mind that in modern systems of classification, birds are reptiles. Um, right. So you can certainly get high levels of intelligence um, along those lines. Um, the um, you know, dinosaurs, some of the dinosaurs in the late part of the late Cretaceous were about as brainy as the mammals at the time. So you could have... Uh, and of course, there have been many science fiction writers who've taken that further uh, in right. alternate histories or what have you, where those are the, the inheritors of the earth. Um, so uh, the, in general, though, there, there's sort of a, a, I don't know if it's a lack of imagination or an attempt to at least keep it familiar so that the audience uh, is, is relating to it. To, to not elaborate too much on it. Um, so it looks like sort of generic lizards and they don't have their own particular um, aspects of their biology. Now, that said, of course, there are many great authors that do have particular tricks of their biology uh, that make them unique and not sort of generic lizard people. Um, plus I think lizards are cool. So I got a couple of them behind me right now. So. <laughs> CJ, what do you think about lizards as the the top dog sentient species that might come to visit? Well, I, I think what got in their way is that some of the more advanced ones had sort of given up on four limbs. Um, and um, uh, of course, by the time you get to birds, they, they sort of morph themselves into <laughs> technology um, rather than using their four limbs to uh, manipulate and invent as, as uh, uh, primates ultimately did. But um, yeah, I, I think that uh, you know, we, we also are somewhat uh, terracentric 
here. I'm, there may be yet more ways to be a critter than we have explored on this planet. Oh yes, um, absolutely. And we may not even recognize the ones that were there just before coming on here. I was um, listening to a program about intelligent trees. Mm -hmm. um, would we recognize a, a, an alien intelligence if it just moved very slowly? Uh, if it's time scale for communication and biological process, we're much off from ours. So um, here we, we may have been living on top of a communication system that, um, that we haven't recognized um, chemical communication that just takes place at the, uh, at the speed of osmosis. Right, right, absolutely. Um, it's really fascinating to think about those sorts of different parts of, we tend to as authors start from terrorist, terrestrial origins and posit from there. Um, and as someone put in the chat earlier, there's so many odd little branches in terrestrial uh, biology that are so seem so, <laughs> pardon? I said, we're still discovering them down in the depths and- in Exactly, the depths. That's, and they, some of them seem so unlikely that they, they make great perfect space aliens, even mm -hmm. though they're terrestrial origin. Caitlin, what is your thought on reptiles? Oh, goodness. Well, I, I personally think that reptiles just look cool. Uh, so as far as, I, as astrobiology goes, though, it's, it's something interesting that we, uh, as, uh, as CJ mentioned, though, is that there's so many different ways of communication that now we're realizing, oh, not everyone is going to radio back to earth and go, hey, we're a thing. I, they may not even use radio telescopes. They may use a completely different form of communication and either we're too advanced and it's like trying to send us uh, I don't know, a laser disc at this point, or, uh, or we're not advanced enough and right. we are still in the flip phone era of, right. of communications. Um, so as far as, as lizard uh, uh, type goes, it's, that would be fascinating for sure. It, for would sure. Be. it would be. What do you think, Jim? Structurally is, and, and Caitlin, jump in here too. I mean, the this, and any of y'all, the, the structure, physical structure of reptiles on earth anyway, uh, would lend itself to some degree to space because it is weightlessness. Well, I'd like to say, before I start on that, uh, CJ Cherry is correct about the trees. Uh, James Schmidt wrote several books in which the trees are intelligent. And in fact, the problem of communication is in fact the time frame difference that she mentioned. But in the human case, it's kind of got a bad thing because when the trees get together and decide they were sufficiently pissed off by the humans, they got together collectively and they're collectively their power is enough to kill all the humans on the planet. So <laughs> it becomes a problem on a different sort. As far as reptiles are concerned, I really think that a species tends to, to increase what makes procreation more likely. That is a natural selection process involving procreation. If you have a carnivore, it, this very, very, the nature will tend to make a better carnivore. If you have an herbivore, you'll tend to make a better herbivore. Uh, but those are not necessarily ways to go towards intelligence. It might be better to have a faster sprint than it might be to have a bigger brain. Mm -hmm. it, seems, it seems to me that you're almost looking at um, are, are the uh, ones that eat any, everything. Uh, what's the name of them? Um, omnivores. Omnivores. omnivores I, yeah. I had the word a minute ago and I lost <laughs> it because they have to solve problems. The more you are a generalist, the more likely it is to be a better generalist. You have to be, have to be brighter. So I would say that even in my own field of nuclear power, I find that uh, we have specialist inspectors who are really great at looking at, say, welds. But if the problem is not welds, they're lost. And you have generalist inspectors who are pretty good at a lot of things and maybe better at some than others. I think natural selection will drive uh, the tool users when you are trying to solve problems as a generalist, as neither a specialist in eating plants nor a specialist in eating meat. So where right. do lizards fit in there? Well, 
there's a lot of them that'll eat just about anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as Tom will attest, many of our past uh, creatures would eat both plants and animals. So sure, and sure. Birds certainly do. Sure, and um, you know, plenty of modern lizards, uh, iguanas, uh, my beardy dragons, and so forth are are omnivores. Um, but yeah, you need to have a bunch of of selective features to push you along the way towards uh, towards high intelligence. Um, that you know, you could be a perfectly good omnivore, but not too bright. Again my bearded dragons, um, yeah. <laughs> but um, you could also be um, an animal like an octopus, which people are pointing out uh, in the list, which have very high intelligence as far as mollusks go. Okay, granted, that's, you know, uh, pray, uh, sort of faint praise there, but um, uh, they do show, you know, complex problem solving ability and yet are very, very, very different than, than terrestrial life. One thing right. I put in the chat um, was that uh, a lot of writers um, and producers and so forth, for the obvious reason, because they're basing on things, what they're familiar with, tend to tap into just a handful of major modern groups of animals. I mean, vertebrates, arthropods, cephalopods, and then plants. But there's so many other ways of being an animal even just with an animal, much less other sorts of biology. I mean, echinoderms, uh, you know, you've got a hydraulic internal system. You don't use muscles to move, you use hydraulics, um, five-fold symmetry and so forth, so. What is an echinoderm? Oh. Five <laughs> sure, um, yeah, echinoderms, it's the larger group that contains starfish and sea urchins and sea cucumbers and brittle stars. Um, and this extinct group, the crinoids, and Lovecraft actually had one of the many weird aliens uh, um, races in, in Lovecraft has sort of an, are inspired by echinoderms. You have a five-fold star-like head. But um, okay. yeah, there's just so many different weird ways of doing things that most people are, are less familiar with because you know uh, biology at that level, when you're talking about creatures we don't interact with on a daily basis, uh, it's weird, and there's just so much knowledge out there. It's uh, hard to to grasp it all. There so is hear that off. Hear that aspiring authors. You got a large field to choose from. What were you going to say, CJ? Oh, I was going to say there, there's one limiting factor. Chemistry proceeds faster at warm temperatures. Yes. And therefore, if you cannot regulate your temperature uh, by some means, you have trouble surviving in colder climates because your chemistry just doesn't run fast enough uh, to keep you alive. And um, so there are some structures, some chemical processes that are going to possibly be better than others. Um, probably also one of the more successful creatures is the one that can run faster when it's cold mm -hmm. yeah. um, because the prey can't. And um, uh, therefore, uh, a general uh, temperature regulating species mm -hmm. is more apt to rise to a position of prominence. So omnivores, temperature regulation, <laughs> and chemical signatures. Um, one of the questions in, uh, from the group is, does anyone on the panel have advice for coming up with original astrobiology? And since you're an astrobiologist, Caitlin, I'm gonna ask that of you first. <laughs> well, I, stemming from CJ's uh, comment here is that I, when we look at different planets, different planetary structures, yes, uh, temperature and pressure are very important for us. Um, but what's cool is that there's planets and even moons out there that have a regular internal ocean that is mm -hmm. incredibly warm and yet the surface is uh, you know negative hundreds and hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit uh, but the ocean could be just as warm and just as salty as the Pacific Ocean. There could be hydrothermal vents on Europa and Enceladus which is fantastic um, but let's look at Titan, uh, Saturn's largest moon. Uh, Titan for I recently, because of the Cassini mission, 
there's organic molecules um, I, where you have compounds that have been uh, irradiated and chained together in the atmosphere. And just that kind of complex chemistry, and it's so blasted cold <laughs> on Titan, then gives us reason of like, oh, well, molecules, very complex molecules um, that could eventually lead to complex uh, cellular organisms uh, could still be very much at very regular cold temperatures. There's also places uh, on the moon where the surface of the moon does have a, a very high low temperature change okay, but there's craters on the moon that are just as cold as Pluto and they stay as cold, <laughs> which is so fascinating. Uh, and that's actually still part of my job though, is to figure out like, why? Why is it still so cold? What could possibly still <laughs> be cold there? And, and Mars, by all means, that's what we're doing on Mars as well. There's, there's salty puddles on the subsurface of Mars. So as an astrobiologist, we have to keep in mind of, of certainly the temperature. We have to keep of mind of the chemistry of it all. Right, right. Well, from an engineering standpoint, Jim, what do you think? What What's a uh, uh, advice for coming up with original astrobiology? Well, <clears throat> we, I, I would suggest one way to, is to go to the black smokers that are deep within our own ocean. Mm. We have beings down there that do not use <clears throat> photosynthesis, which is the heart of almost all the life that we generally deal with on earth, either directly by the plants or indirectly by eating the plants or indirectly by eating the things that eat the things that eat the plants things of that sort. They have chemosynthesis and they have phototropic synthesis. So both of those mechanisms would be available, especially on Caitlin's Europa. So I would suggest that uh, that would be a good potential candidate for sources. As far as the engineering aspects, uh, gravity has a very harsh penalty uh, for beings trying to evolve within very, very great fields, but they may not feel it's very great. Robert Forward's uh, Dragon's Egg, I think is the name of that, his breakout novel, mm -hmm. where they lived on a neutron star. Uh, I would say that uh, you, one of the things that bothers me in science fiction is that those heavy planet beings are so powerful when they're not on their own planet, yet we ourselves face severe challenges in zero gravity as a species because we've evolved with the gravity that we have. I would not be surprised, like I'd be surprised if, if such beings didn't have worse problems with zero gravity. Remember, they were optimized for the gravity they evolved in, natural selection again. So I would say that you have to be very careful of your engineering if you're changing the gravitational fields that your beings evolve in. Right, I know Norton, I think it was Norton that postulated that there would be people who had come from heavy gravities and people who had come from light gravities and there would be a disparity in their of course, in her, that particular story, I think she postulated a certain level of, uh, of uh, um, prejudice as well. So, um, Tom, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things, and uh, uh, Jim mentioned, and someone in the chat had mentioned uh, Dragon's Egg earlier, and that reminded me also of there was a short story by Derek Kunskin in As an Asimov issue not too long ago. Oh, great, it's phasing away. Here we go. <laughs> Yeah. Um, where the life exists on a planet orbiting a pulsar and it's operating at bizarre temperature. See, he's actually a, a molecular biologist, truly bizarre. It is metallic based life. The, the, it is not, it's not a chemical exchange of carbon or oxygen at all that's involved. It, it's actually fluctuations in the magnetic field which is the exchange system in this ecology. And it's truly weird. And there's a, apparently this is the second story he's written with these organisms in it. So I'm gonna track down where the first one was and see what else is in there. So, uh, you know, that th there's a great example of life finds a way in a life originating and evolving in conditions that are utterly non-terrestrial. Right. Um, and, uh, I wrote, if, if I recall correctly, the way things feed, it's not really consuming other organisms, it's they attach themselves and complete a circuit and basically charge themselves back up 
and then detach and the, the, the various plant analogs then have to reabsorb energy from the fluctuating magnetic fields to charge themselves back up. <laughs> How very cool. Yeah, it's you, really weird. <laughs> what, do you, what do you advice do you have for panel for people trying to come up with original astrobiology? Yeah, one of the things I posted in chat is uh, a couple decades ago, there was a book uh, by uh, Jean, uh, so Jean Berlinski, I believe is the name, um, called Life in Darwin's Universe. Oh, Jean uh, Berlinski, Life in Darwin's Universe, which was sort of a good uh, overview of looking at sort of the rules of biology. And then if you tweak this, then what are some of the things you can then do with it? Um, so trying to talk about realistic approaches to alien life. And I know there's been a new book that's just out. I have a copy. I haven't read it yet called, hang on. <laughs> the just Zoologist's just back Guide to the Galaxy. It's over on the table over there, um, which is premised on the same sort of concept. And unfortunately, I looked at the bibliography there and they weren't aware of this other book. So I don't know how much it's retreading the old stuff. Right. Um, but um, so some people have advice out there on, you know, in book form to get people started. Yeah. Uh, but I would also say be creative, you know, be yeah. well, cool. Obviously we want to read we have, cool stories. We have someone amongst us who has been very creative. So CJ, what is your advice mm. to people who are, uh, who are starting out and looking to create alien biology? Um, several. Um, first of all, um, I would say a good science class helps. <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, um, uh, try running a marine tank for a while. That'll, that'll give you a whole new insight. Um, the, um, uh, I, I was thinking while you were talking about the hydrothermal vents, there is absolutely nothing that tells me that we can't be creating life continually at this very moment. It just gets eaten by things that are more efficient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, some of them might uh, might be close enough to something else that uh, that you we never notice it. But yeah. Um, yeah, there there are you're probably safest by sticking to biological processes that uh, that your own science is is adequate to describe. Um, but um, uh, it's also very difficult to devise a plot. Um, I rather liked uh, Hal Clement's mission of gravity and, and uh, others where you're dealing with something that uh, just simply cannot interact with us, um, but, um, but has a story. And um, it's got to be something that dramatically uh, human beings instinctively understand the drive to survive is a good one. Right. Um, but um, in general, I also think that when you start working toward technology or technological life forms uh, that to a certain extent form follows function and need dictates and physics is physics when you're dealing with uh, you know winds atmospheres uh, will alien airplanes look greatly different than our early airplanes my own opinion is probably not because what you're trying to adapt to is the same environment um, so just as um, uh, environment drives uh, our physical evolution. Um, it also drives our technological evolution. So if you end up with two species who are occupying a similar niche in a very similar environment, uh, their technology may have followed amazingly similar pathways. Right. And I think that we as writers are going to postulate things that are probably not surviving at vent level you know, in dark, complete darkness, because we're postulating interaction. And we might not be, you know, that those creatures may be out there in space, but they're not interact, interested in interacting with warm-blooded. And know. we also have to engage the sympathy of the reader. And right, to, exactly. To your sympathy for um, something that is very different requires some, some sort of problem that we can imagine. Right. Right, which is, I think, drives all fiction stories of astrobiology. I think you can postulate all manner of creatures, but 
you have to have a problem to solve or an interaction to deal with. Um, one of the questions in chat is, can you discuss the effects of different gravities on alien structure and biology? And that might be a good one for you, Caitlin. <laughs> it was a little bit on what we were talking about earlier. A little bit, yeah. So uh, it's a gravity, um, so surface pressure. What we're all feeling right now is, is one bar pressure here on Earth. I, what's cool though is that um, looking at how pressures and gravities work on, on other moons and planets, I, yeah, we're still very much learning about the, the human uh, physiology uh, in weightlessness and space. We actually tried that out um, with a very famous experiment, uh, the twin brother, uh, Mark and Scott Kelly brothers. Uh, um, one was up in space for about a year, the other one uh, in Arizona. And we uh, tried to uh, get them to eat pretty much the, the same thing, have them try to do like the same exercises, the same tasks and everything that we brought. Um, Scott back down, uh, fantastic a book called Endurance uh, by Scott Kelly, though I highly recommend it. Uh, but there's a lot that we're still realizing about astronaut health. Uh, right. and, and in that case, that's just the weightlessness part of it. Now we're trying to figure out, oh, how does the human body react to like being on the moon? We've sent a number of astronauts, but we didn't really care <laughs> about the human body at the time. We're like, let's just get people to take, to bring back moon rocks because we can and we wanted to you know right. and and so we're i uh, now the, the the artemis program is uh is going to be essentially the apollo program 2.0 i uh, i uh, so that's going to be a, a huge boom of lunar astronauts for us and then eventually to mars how is the human body going to be on that long journey one-way journey to mars and then beyond mars i uh, so right. you're changing from microgravity to still just a little itty bitty bit of surface gravity on Mars. That's going to be a huge time change uh, for the body. And so your, your muscles are going to really make sure your muscles don't get into atrophy. <laughs> it's going to be yeah. the terrifying part and yeah. all that. Um, but say if uh, we're never going to land people on Venus, but Venus has 90 bars pressure. That is humongous pressure uh, right. on on such a surface i uh, and uh, certainly any planets near pulsars that just blows my mind that there are actually planets near pulsar systems uh they would have immense immense pressure uh on those planets as well but yeah we're still learning about the human body i uh, and it's it's mind-blowing um and we all think about muscles i uh, uh changing but right. not to be gross or anything though, but like everything in your body is, is changing uh, when you're in space. So like your eyeballs are floating in your head. Mm -hmm. So astronauts can't cry, <laughs> fun fact. Um, <laughs> I, they, also, they also can't fart or burp because there's no pressure uh, right. on, on like their internal systems. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's very interesting. Um, you know, everything is floating inside of you. Um, but also we don't really have very good ideas as to how like the bloodstreams work in microgravity oh, either. Right. So, and, and so that's something to keep in mind as well is the anatomy uh, of our, of our blood <laughs> streams are, are going to be put to such limits to extremes and we barely scratch have, the surface of we that. have no clue yeah it's <laughs> interesting because this leads into another story that uh, or a question that somebody's asked and and i'm going to start with cj on this one is it uh you know in previous decades and all through the last hundred or so years when we've talked about science fiction we have all you know authors of the past have never dealt with that sort of thing how the body reacts in space we've just authors just sort of said oh they went there and you know, assumed a whole lot of stuff. Um, so obviously the depictions of not only space travel, but aliens have changed between classic and more recent science fiction. Um, the question is, are there areas where the field has definitely improved or are there still ruts that we've fallen into in terms of depicting aliens and depicting space travel? What do you think, CJ? Well, there's, there's still, um, I, I would, say 
less ruts than than not exploring areas that we now could get into. Um, and um, living in space, living in space long term. Um, in my own universe, planets are more or less navigational hazards, and uh, uh, most of uh, most of humanity uh, that is not on Earth is uh, living permanently in space. Um, naturally, there are adaptations. Um, they do not exist in microgravity. So, uh, well, they do, but it, they're not um, living with it um, because of the, the, the space stations, the, the way the ships are constructed and so on and so forth. So. It's not as if we've evolved into a new species. We're just uh, making our environment comfortable for the way we do business. We're a ways from that. Um, I think it would be a pretty large space station that actually could rotate well enough to give you anything like gravity above the knees. And, um, uh, you know, that's kind of inconvenient for the rest of you. <laughs> it's still floating, yeah. <laughs> what, do you, what do you say to that, Bill? from a structural standpoint. To who are you addressing it? I'm sorry, I said Bill. Jim. Okay. I was looking at your last name. I got it. Well. Uh, Brain fog. I agree completely with, with CJ, as, as well I should, obviously. <laughs> but as an engineer, I would say that the, the original construct concept of the Stanford Taurus was to make a structure that could rotate uh, fast enough that could get the gravity field uh, apparent what you would need. And they also had to have it big enough so that the rotation rate angular apart wasn't so bad that it would be, uh, uh, you would always be in vertigo at the same time. So they had to work backwards from two constraints and that's how they got the size of the Stanford Taurus. I would note though that no one has ever tested it in space. That is, we presume that uh, that form of, uh, Force, centripetal force would, uh, centrifugal or centripetal acceleration, however you want to put it, everyone assumes that that will act like gravity if you build the structure large enough. But we've never really tested that. In fact, what tests we've done uh, on the limited basis we have uh, cast doubts that it really will have the effect. But obviously, we're going to write it that way anyway until someone proves us wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I would note, though, that the Stanford Taurus idea, the, the size of the station was so large and the structural steel amounts were so high that uh, even if we were determined to build it, it would take thousands of launches of the heavy Falcon. And most of the mass, that's only a few percent of the actual mass of the Stanford Taurus. It was rest of it presumed there was a moon base that was using a mass thrower to throw mass in the direction of the Stanford Taurus location that would then be made into the rest of the space station. So we're talking a very large structure. Right, right. So, Tom, do you have anything you'd like to add to that one? No, I think they've covered pretty much anything I would have said, and they did it better than I would. So, <laughs> so somebody posted in the questions. Uh, it seems like a lot of science fiction concept concepts have an anthropic bias. Uh, I'm not sure what they mean by that, but um, my my. Uh, language skills are defeating me here. So uh, what, what, do you, what do you think about that, Tom? Yeah, I think if, they, if, if by that they're, they're thinking that um, uh, it's got the idea that there is the imperative towards, towards the evolution of intelligent life. Um, I'd say that, yeah, most, most fiction does have that bias and that's because they want to tell stories where minds right. other than ours meet ours. Uh, of course, that's not necessarily the way the real universe operates. I used to, used to give a lecture uh, that actually I stole the, the Belinsky title and I called it Life in Darwin's Universe, where by a couple tweaks of the Drake equation uh, that are you know, realistically informed by the history of life so far, you can wind up where the N in Drake's equation suggests that there are you need multiple galaxies, many multiple galaxies before you get one other technological communicating civilization at the same time that you exist. That technological communicating civilizations may be extraordinar extraordinarily rare, but that animal grade life might be more common. 
There's no reason right. that animals have to produce technological intelligences. And of course, the vast majority of life out there is probably slime worlds. And <laughs> even Kirk on his loneliness, and his loneliest, is probably not going to interact with them the way he would with intelligences as he normally interacts with them. <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, the interesting thing, of course, in this discussion is that astrobiology can go any direction. I mean, as, as Caitlin was saying, there's with all of the cold planets and uh, there may be life evolving that we would never understand. Mm -hmm. For storytellers, like CJ says, it's really about the interaction. So there are probably dozens and dozens of planets out there that hold some kind of life. It's just whether or not it actually is reaching for the stars and wants to interact with us either as scientists, as Caitlin said, or as explorers or as conquerors. Um, we as storytellers are telling about those kind of things. Um, so somebody in the uh, questions posted, bacteria on earth communicate via quorum sensing. Astrobiologists think that microbial life is most likely to come, likely common form of life to be found on exoplanets. Has anyone ever done a story in which aliens are basically bacteria that have a hive mind? Do you guys know of any? I know that uh, um, uh, Anne McCaffrey did one that had a hive mind, but it was an insectoid kind of universe versus microbial. Can you think of any? Uh, I, I know someone in the chat said probably. I think that's the safe answer because there's just so much science fiction out there. Someone's yeah. done it. Um, <laughs> I mentioned in the chat before about intelligent an intelligent virus. You know, some people have done that, but those weren't necessarily done. Those were done uh, not necessarily as hard science sort of extrapolations. Where the the, the, the questioner there wanted something that's sort of a realistic view of uh, an intelligent bacterial mat. Um, right. right. Interesting right. idea. Yeah. Yeah, well, it is. Intelligence is, is um, uh, seeking survival and doing it en masse. Um, I suppose you could muster up a conflict between two masses competing for the same resource. However, right. the dialogue is difficult. Yes. <laughs> Writing the dialogue for that would be really challenging. <laughs> So another thing that's out there that we uh, we have, you know, it's based both on our terrestrial fears and the interesting biology are insects. Jim, from your perspective as an engineer, do insects have what it takes to to become world conquerors? And well, I suspect cockroaches are going to be the last critter standing, no matter what. <laughs> yeah. But if we but if we want to talk about intelligent uh, and tool using. Uh, the insect form of uh, breathing causes a little bit of a problem. Doesn't scale up very well, very well. Uh, best I know, they they have uh, their exoskeleton creatures in general have a problem. Uh, so I would say, if you change your definition of insect a little bit, and you don't make it exoskeleton, and you uh, incorporate some of the features we we anthropomorphize with, I think you could get there but you've got to have to have a different contract and we might not recognize it as an insect. We would, we would I, recognize, I, we would identify it as something else. I sort of re-engineered them um, mm. in uh, uh, my rather large insects, um, but I played, you know, they look like insects on the surface, but there are a good deal of uh, internal structural differences. I, I would not be surprised if you might not be right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that the insects that I know, you couldn't scale up, but yeah. insects you know, you probably could scale up. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, what are your thoughts? As far as insects scaling up, oh no, I'm already dealing with the cicadas and brood 10 right now, so I don't <laughs> want to scale up any more insects, please. I, <laughs> but, uh, but something in the chat that popped up that I, I'm like, yes, for is tardigrades. Um, I, so, so I'm interested to hear what Jim has to say about uh, tardigrades. Jim? Those are the very, very small critters, right? Yeah. Yeah. Little yeah. water bears. Yeah. I, I would say Tom might be better. I'm going to pass the buck to Tom on that one. <laughs> sure. Um, tardigrades can't even function at the size of an insect. Uh, tardigrades form of respiration is even simpler diffusion. So people are all about how awesome they are. And they're so awesome because they're so small and they take advantage of that. And if you start scaling them up, then 
that's exactly why other arthropods or true arthropods evolved more complex respiratory systems um, so that they could deal with, uh, you know, actually have gills in the case of crustaceans or book lungs in the case of spiders or, or trachea in the case of, of insects and millipedes. Um, so that, um, yeah, in order for a tardigrade to be big, it has to evolve new traits and stop being exactly like tardigrades are. Yeah, well, on sure. that note, on that note, we're going to have to stop. This has been absolutely fascinating. I've almost lost track of time. So why don't we go around and say where people can find us on the web or the rest of the uh, of the con. CJ? Oh, where can people find you on the web? <laughs> www.cherry.com. There you go. <laughs> also on and, Facebook. Excellent. Caitlin? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Aaron's Science. And uh, you could also just look me up at nasa.gov. If you excellent. have any further questions, you can feel free to email. Great. Tom, I know you, uh, are you still to do your panel today or did you? Yeah, do I've got my, my big dinosaurs, the update, my annual panel uh, is at four and here's my contact info I just put into chat. Most excellent. Jim? Well, I don't really have a web presence like these other people do. Uh, you can read my science articles at bain.com. I guess my next appearance is going to be uh, facing off alongside CJ Cherry again tonight, this evening. But I want to know, Tom, that I'm going to be in the audience along with my wife watching your four o'clock. Excellent. I want to, what, one common, one thing I like to add at the very end. If you exclude noble gases, 95.5% of the visible universe is hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. Mm -hmm. So silicon is only six and a half hundredths of 1%. So if you're going to find life out there of any size on the macroscopic level, I'm going to bet it's going to be comprised of hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. Well, there you go. Yep. We, are, we are those creatures. Hopefully, we will find some out there someday. Or, they have, or they've already found us, a la the U.S. Navy's uh, admission. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much, everyone, for being here today with Balticon 55 and Alien Life and Science Fiction and Astrobiology. Thank you to my panelists and have a great rest of the con. <laughs>